Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India ahead to in the course is to try to uh, uh, expand the uh, category of varieties ok. So, so far we have been looking at uh, affine varieties and quasi affine varieties which are open subsets of affine varieties, but then we need to also include uh, more general varieties uh, and the next uh, in this list are the projective varieties and the quasi projective varieties and uh, the projective varieties are uh, they have properties which are very different from the properties of affine varieties ok. So, uh, so you know what I wanted to start with is uh, uh, since we are uh, looking at uh, we have been looking at affine varieties ok. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is about the so called Jacobian conjecture which is a which is a very simply stated conjecture, but which is uh, an uh, which is open even in the simplest case ok. And uh, the reason it makes sense to talk about that conjecture now is because you know what automorphisms you know what I morphisms of varieties are you know what are isomorphisms of varieties and you know how to characterize uh, uh, isomorphisms of affine varieties ok. So, uh, so I will I'll first I uh, will first recall the following thing from the previous lecture. So, if you recall uh, x any variety of course here for us uh, any variety will mean either affine variety or quasi affine variety ok. Uh, and y an affine variety. which means y is um, an irreducible closed subset of some affine space uh, over an algebraically closed field of course. Uh, then uh, we have a natural bijection so on, on the one hand you have uh, morphism of varieties from x to y that is bijective to uh, homomorphisms of k algebras from a y to o x ok. We, we proved this bijection and in fact what was the uh, what was the uh, if you if you recall this map uh, we if I call this map as alpha then how does this, how is this map defined it is the, the map in this direction is just given by pull back of uh, uh, regular functions ok. So, you know in other words if f from x to y is an element on this side 
namely it is a morphism from the variety x to the affine variety y then you uh, you send it to alpha f this alpha f is going to be a k algebra homomorphism from the ring of polynomial functions on y to the regular functions on x and that is uh, very very easy uh, namely you give me a polynomial function uh, let me put it as p on uh, um, let me put it as uh, yeah, capital P give me a polynomial function capital P on y okay you compose it with f to get a regular function on x note that uh, a of y is the affine coordinate ring of y the coordinate ring of functions polynomial functions on y it is just it is just polynomials restricted to y and these are the polynomial functions on the affine space in which y sits y is an affine variety so y sits inside some a n the, the ambient the bigger affine space and uh, on this bigger ambient affine space you have the polynomials in n variables you and each of these polynomial functions by evaluation defines a map into k which can be thought of as a map into a1 and it is a regular function of course and you restrict such polynomials to uh, any subset in particular to y and you get a polynomial function on y only the only thing is that this polynomial function on y uh, is not represented by a unique polynomial it is represented up to addition by a polynomial in the ideal of y okay uh, which consists of polynomials which vanish on y okay. So give me a polynomial restricted to y and I just compose it with f uh, first apply p then apply f that is a that is a regular function on x because a polynomial function restricted to y is of course a regular function on y and uh, what is happening is I have a regular function on y and then by composing it with f I get uh, the pullback of the regular function uh, on x and the pullback of a regular function has to be a regular function because f is a morphism because that is already built into the definition of a morphism. So uh, this is how this map is defined okay and uh, there is also uh, uh, there is also uh, the uh, if you look at the map in the reverse direction uh, alpha inverse how is that defined well uh, give me a uh, give me a, a home of some phi from uh, k algebra home of some from ay to ox okay and uh, then of course you know if uh, if of course you know you assume that uh, 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 y is thought of as sitting inside affine space uh, and uh, a y is just well uh, k of is identified with k of x1 xn which is the polynomials on the affine space the xi being the coordinate functions divided by the ideal of y okay and uh, so what you do is that you just take the xi you take the xi bars which are elements here they are the images of xi in this quotient okay. So xi bar just denotes the coset xi plus iy in the quotient ring okay and you simply send it to a certain function uh, let us call it as hi it is a regular function on x and the fact is that you will uh, what will happen is that from x to uh, from x to a n you will have a map which will send any point x small x to this h1 x this n tuple defined by the hs hn of x because I have n of the xi's so I have their images here which are n of the xi bars so I get n of the hi's okay and then I evaluate this point at each of these n functions I get an n tuple which is a point in a n this is the map and the fact is that this map will factor through a morphism g uh, uh, through the closed irreducible closed sub variety y of a n this diagram will commute and this phi will be nothing but alpha of g this is the surjectivity okay. So start with the start with the phi here then you get these hi's 
using the hi's you define a morphism of x into a n the morphism will land inside y and if you call that morphism as g then alpha of g is the phi that you started with okay that is the surjectivity that gives all the surjectivity and uh, that also defines how uh, that the alpha inverse of phi is this g okay g g is just alpha inverse of phi this is how uh, you get the inverse map and that is how this is a bijection okay and as a corollary to this uh, what happens is that uh, if you know if x is also an affine variety then uh, ox can be replaced by ax because for an affine variety uh, uh, the ring of regular functions it can be uh, uh, naturally identified with the uh, the polynomials restricted to the affine variety okay so uh, and alpha will take uh, uh, a bijection to a bijection okay and therefore what it will tell you is that if x is also affine then x and y are uh, 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 alpha uh, in fact I should say uh, alpha will take an isomorphism to an isomorphism okay that is an invertible not just a bijection but an invertible morphism to an invertible morphism uh, an invertible morphism varieties will go to an invertible ring homomorphism okay that is a ring isomorphism an isomorphism of varieties will go to an isomorphism of k algebras fact okay. So alpha will carry isomorphism to, to isomorphisms uh, provided you know uh, x is affine alright and uh, what that will tell you is that it will tell you that two affine varieties are isomorphic if and only if they are coordinate rings affine coordinate rings that is just the rings of polynomials. Uh, on those varieties are isomorphic. So the corollary to this is the corollary to this is uh, is uh, x uh, affine and y affine are isomorphic if and only if if and only if a x and a y are isomorphic of course this uh, the isomorphism which when I say x and y are affine and isomorphic there I mean isomorphism as varieties and when I say a x and a y are isomorphic I mean isomorphism as as, a, as k algebras okay. So two affine varieties are isomorphic if and only if the they are uh, rings of polynomials the rings of polynomial functions on those affine varieties are isomorphic as k algebras okay uh, and how many such uh, how many such uh, isomorphisms are there uh, there are as many as there are as many isomorphisms here as there are isomorphisms here okay. So uh, you know as a particular case what you can do is well uh, you know I can take uh, uh, I can take for x and y just a n itself so you know take take uh, uh, x equal to y is equal to a n so what you will get is you will get morphisms of varieties from a n to a n uh, uh, is uh, is bijective to the k algebra homomorphisms from a of a n to a of a n to a of a n and of course you know a of a n is the is just the polynomial ring so you know if you want uh, well both of these are equal to k if you want x1 etc xn okay if you take them to be the ring of polynomials if you if you take the ring of polynomials to be the ring of polynomials in n indeterminates x size okay and uh, in particular if I look at the automorphisms uh, so the word automorphism means a self isomorphism it is a, uh, a morphism is from one object to another object an automorphism is a morphism from the object back into itself and uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, a uh, morphism of an object back into itself in general is called an endomorphism okay and 
an invertible endomorphism is called an automorphism okay. So, here of course, when I say morphisms from a n to a n actually I am looking at the endomorphisms of a n. So, this is all the endomorphisms these are maps from a n back into itself they are endomorphisms. So, of course, the uh, you know the other notation is endomorphisms as varieties of a n and of course, here uh, what I will have is endomorphisms as k algebras of the polynomial ring a of a n okay. And what are the automorphisms the automorphisms are the in invertible endomorphisms they are is they are endomorphisms which are also isomorphisms okay. So, they are self maps they are morphisms of the object back into itself which can be inverted okay. So, if you look at the automorphisms that is of course, a uh, uh, the this if you if you look at it carefully this is a group because the composition of two uh, morphisms is again a morphism therefore, the composition of two automorphisms is again an automorphism. So, this is a group and on the other hand you also have a group here uh, this is automorphisms as k algebras of k uh, well let me write as uh, a of a n okay. So, uh, and and then alpha carries automorphisms to automorphisms okay. So, this alpha uh, will also give you a map like this okay. You start with the morphism a morphism is an isomorphism if and which means it is here if and only its image is here and conversely okay. And uh, uh, now the uh, uh, you see the the Jacobian conjecture is connected with uh, uh, automorphisms of the polynomial ring all right. So, so let me so let me make a statement. Uh, uh, so, what I want to look at is uh, let us take let us take any morphism from uh, a n to a n okay. How is it going to be given it is going to be given by n polynomials in the n variables okay any element a uh, phi of uh, uh, or let me use uh, f of morphisms of varieties from a n to a n is given by by uh, polynomials Uh, in fact, uh, so let me write this f1, etc., fn in n variables. So n polynomials in n variables. That's right. That's just because of this bijection. Okay. So you know uh, what are all these? You know, I start with. So here is my f from an to an. Uh, then you know I have this is this is mapped that is this point th that is an element here it is mapped to an element here which is alpha of f and this alpha of f is a map from well k x1 etcetera xn to k x1 etcetera xn where I am identifying the uh, ring of polynomials on an with k x1 etcetera xn okay and how is a from a polynomial ring uh, m a map uh, is dictated by the images of the variables. So, you know if I take if I take alpha f of uh, x i this is what alpha f takes x i to and this n tuple dictates the uh, the k algebra homomorphism alpha of f because of the universal property of the polynomial okay. So, so what I want to tell you is that uh, and it is these alpha f of x i's I am that I am calling as f i's okay. So, so let me write that here uh, I will need a better duster um, so I have x i going to alpha of f of x i 
and I am calling this as f i ok. So, uh, essentially what you are doing is that uh, corresponding to this morphism a n to a n uh, uh, that corresponds to giving me n polynomials ok and uh, that is what I have written in the previous line that a morphism that a morphism from a n to n is simply given by n polynomials in n variables ok. And when is this morphism uh, an isomorphism when it has an inverse ok. F is an automorphism that is it is a invertible morphism namely an isomorphism uh, if it has has an inverse ok and uh, so so it, ha it has an inverse f inverse. So you see what will happen is I will have an f inverse which again will go from a n to a n ok and uh, that will be mapped under alpha to alpha of f inverse that will turn out to be again uh, a uh, map k algebra homomorphism from the polynomial ring in n variables to again to itself back into itself and that is again going to be dictated by uh, the images of the x i's under this uh, so alpha of f uh, inverse of x i ok and well uh, if you if I, if I call this as you know if I call this as uh, g i if I call this as g i which means I am I am just calling f inverse as g ok uh, by my previous notation if f goes to f1 etc fn then f inverse equal to g will go to g1 etc gn all right and uh, uh, what you can see immediately is that uh, uh, see you will have uh, if i start with a point x1 etc if i start with a point with coordinates lambda1 etc lambda n that will go under uh, 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 if i apply the map f to it what I am going to get is f1 of lambda 1 lambda n and so on fn of lambda 1 etc lambda n this is the point it is going to go to ok that is what it means to send the x i's to uh, f i's under alpha of f ok. And now uh, this point uh, is if I if I apply uh, if I apply f inverse which is g this point has to go back to this but uh, under f inverse where will this point go see this point will go to g 1 of f 1 of the lambda so I will put a I will put it like this dot 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 g n of f 1 lambda f n lambda this is what it means. So, what where where of course you know where uh, lambda underline is just lambda 1 through lambda n ok. So, what you get is g i of f 1 lambda etcetera f n lambda is simply lambda i for every i this is what happens if you have a if you have an automorphism right and uh, uh, now now what you can do is uh, you know this holds for all lambdas ok. So, you can write this in a variable form as g i of f 1 of x f n of x is equal to x i for every i you can write this in variable form ok uh, which makes sense all right. And then you know uh, for example if you want you can take the partial derivative on both sides with respect to any x j 
you will get of course uh, if it is x if you take partial derivative with respect to xi you will get 1 on the right side if you take partial derivative with respect to xj j not equal to i you will get 0 then what you can check is that you can check can check that the Jacobian of do fi by do xj is a non-zero constant. in k okay. So what you must understand is that you see I take each of these polynomials each of these fi's each fi is a polynomial in n variables and if I differentiate partially with respect to each variable I will again get a bunch of polynomials okay I have n polynomials I have the n fi's I differentiate each n of them with respect to the n variables so I will get uh, I get this Jacobian matrix okay that is a that is in general going to be a matrix of polynomials again okay. because you take a polynomial in n variables and differentiate it partially with respect to one of the variables the resulting is uh, uh, the, the resulting thing is again a polynomial in n variables okay and then therefore if you look at the Jacobian determinant then uh, uh, in fact I think the the, the correct uh, uh, maybe it is better to write it as of course uh, here x underline stands for x1 through xn and uh, maybe it is better to write this as Jacobian of f and call it like this okay and the, the point I want to make is that you see if you calculate this Jacobian determinant it is going to only be you expect it only to be a polynomial because a every entry is a polynomial gotten by taking a partial derivative with respect to certain one of the variables but the fact is uh, f has an inverse g okay and therefore you know if you write down everything f followed by f inverse is identity okay and uh, for the identity function if you take the Jacobian you will simply get the identity matrix okay. So finally what will happen is that uh, uh, you will see that the Jacobian polynomial of f into the Jacobian polynomial of g will uh, if you take the product polynomial it will be equal to 1 which will be the Jacobian polynomial of the identity map which is just the identity matrix so you have two product of two polynomials equal to 1 so each of them has to be a constant it has to be a non-zero constant that is why uh, Jacobian of f will be a non-zero constant. So what this a simple argument shows so far is that you know if I start with an automorphism okay I end up with I end up with uh, uh, you know uh, you have bunch of functions I, I, I end up with the n polynomial functions I start with an automorphism f I end up with n polynomial functions whose Jacobian is a non-zero constant okay that the converse of this is true is the Jacobian conjecture okay. So uh, the Jacobian conjecture is is if f is uh, not uh, known to be is f is not given to be to be an isomorphism isom initially does uh, then the condition that the Jacobian of f is a, is a non-zero constant non-zero constant uh, implies f is an automorphism okay this is the Jacobian condition the Jacobian conjecture is that if I start with an f which I do not know is uh, invertible I do not know it is an isomorphism but suppose I have the condition that if you take the Jacobian of f namely you take the Jacobian of these n polynomials that specifies f okay under this correspondence if this Jacobian is a uh, in generally you expect it only to be a polynomial 
in n variables. But suppose it turns out to be a non-constant, I mean a, a, a non-zero constant polynomial. Then uh, the Jacobian conjecture says that f should be invertible. That means you should be able to find another set of polynomials, n polynomials, which if you plug in to f, the f's, you will get back identity. Okay, that is the Jacobian conjecture. And the point is that somehow, uh, uh, so in so uh, another way of stating that is that uh, you know there is a map from here to uh, uh, the polynomial ring given by taking determinant of the Jacobian okay every endomorphism is given by n polynomials and you take the Jacobian determinant of those n polynomials you will get a polynomial. So you get a map from this endomorphism to your uh, uh, ring of polynomials and what we have seen is that the inverse image of uh, k star that is non zero elements of k that uh, uh, well that contains this okay namely every automorphism uh, for every automorphism the the jacobian is a non zero constant but the question is whether if you take the inverse image okay uh, then it will be exactly this that is the question okay namely if you give me n polynomials okay for which the Jacobian determinant is uh, uh, non zero constant do those n polynomials actually correspond to an automorphism is the question. So the question is whether the inverse image of uh, the non zero constants under the Jacobian determinant map from this endomorphism is exactly this we already we know it contains this but what is required to show is that this is exactly this okay that is the Jacobian conjecture and the beautiful thing is that even for uh, k equal to complex numbers and even for n equal to 2 just polynomials in 2 variables this is open okay and it is a very difficult problem and the beautiful thing is that uh, uh, we in the case of complex numbers we have also complex analysis uh, holomorphic functions uh, uh, we have that theory also but it does not uh, seem to have helped. So this is a very deep problem and uh, 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 working uh, being able to solve this or being able to give a counter example to this is uh, is worth uh, being awarded by a, a Fields medal which is the equivalent of the Nobel prize in mathematics. So that is the depth of the problem uh, it is a very hard problem called the Jacobian conjecture and uh, uh, the point is it can be uh, stated now because you people know that there is a bijection between you know. Uh, morph isom uh, morphisms of affine varieties and k algebra homomorphisms of their uh, coordinate rings. So that is the reason why I want to state, state it here. So maybe uh, I hope that uh, many or at least some of you will go ahead and try to tackle this problem in your future career okay alright. So uh, now okay so now this is uh, just to bring in uh, this Jacobian conjecture what I want to do now is uh, 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 I want to go to the question of more general varieties okay. So uh, this is what I want to do next right now uh, so let me uh, uh, so let me give first an example. So uh, what are the varieties that we know so far we know affine varieties and we know quasi affine varieties okay and uh, quasi affine varieties are open subsets of affine varieties and you know that there are quasi affine varieties which are actually affine and uh, for example basic open uh, subsets they are all uh, quasi affine varieties but they are actually isomorphic to affine varieties in a in an affine space of one higher dimension okay because of the so called uh, Rabinovich trick. So uh, uh, the the basic open set defined by non-vanishing of a polynomial is a quasi-affine variety in the in the in that of in that affine space. But in an affine space of dimension one more, it becomes a closed irreducible closed sub variety. Okay. Now the question you can ask is: Are there quasi-affine varieties that are not affine? So I want to give an example of such a specimen. Okay. And uh, just to tell you that there are quasi affine varieties which are not affine varieties. 
So, here is a fact, so here is a claim or I can just put it as lemma uh, A 2 k minus the origin is is not affine, is quasi affine but not affine. So, here is the lemma actually it is more than a lemma it is uh, you can call it a theorem because you are going to use you are going to use uh, uh, you are going to use this result and you know that this result is uh, in in its it is a grand version of the Nullstrom sats. So, it is very bad to call it a lemma but anyway uh, I will call it a lemma all right. So, uh, so and it is usually uh, uh, or maybe I will have second thoughts and at least call it proposition. So, uh, so what are we going to do? See, first let's understand the statement. It's quasi-affine because it's an open subset of an affine variety. Namely, it's an open subset of A2, and it's a non-empty open subset. Okay, because I've only deleted the origin. All right, it's a complement to the origin. So, it's a non-empty open subset. So, it's a certainly a quasi-affine variety. But I want to show it's not affine. What do you mean by saying it's not affine? What I mean by that is it cannot be isomorphic to any affine variety. That means you cannot. Uh, find an isomorphism of this punctured plane okay this is the punctured plane this punctured plane you cannot find an isomorphism of that with an irreducible closed subset of any affine space that is what it means okay that is what it means to say that it is not affine right. So, it means that if I take uh, any map from uh, the punctured plane into any affine space certainly it is never it is never ever going to be a closed embedding I can never expect it to be a closed embedding all right. Uh, so, you see it is like uh, if I if you state it in this generality it looks the proof looks very difficult to you know uh, verify because you are trying to say that I will have to just try to think of uh, look at all possible uh, you know maps morphisms of this into various affine spaces and and I will have to check that each one of these is not a embedding onto a closed subset it is not an isomorphism onto a closed subset that is how that is what it means okay. But there is a but the way we prove it is uh, uh, is rather uh, we, we use uh, the all the techniques that we have developed so far that is some of them. So, we prove by contradiction we go by contradiction. So, suppose uh, uh, a 2 minus a point a 2 a 2 minus the origin puncture plane is affine okay. Now, again what that means is that I am assuming that is isomorphic to an affine variety okay. So, uh, see if it is affine then it has an affine coordinate ring all right. So, uh, then we have a, a bijection. as we have seen there is this bijection alpha which is morphisms of varieties from a 2 minus a point minus the origin uh, to a 2. So, I have this uh, map from this into uh, uh, homo homomorphisms of k algebras from a of a 2 to O of A2 minus a point. Okay, so I have this bijection that I have already written down here. Okay, the set of morphisms from any variety into an affine variety is given by is in bijection with the set of all K algebra homomorphisms from the coordinate ring of the target affine variety to the regular functions on the source variety. Right, so I'm just applying that here, but I'm notice noting that, uh, 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 well, you know, since I've assumed a two minus a point to be an affine variety, I this can be replaced by a of that, okay, and of course, so th so this this is this can be replaced by a of a two minus uh, minus zero comma zero, and what this means is that what does this mean? This means see because I've assumed a two minus a point is affine. 
there is some embedding of it as a any uh, with an uh, some embedding of it into some affine space some big affine space I do not know what dimension and uh, certainly dimension greater than or equal to 2 alright and in that affine space since it is a realized as a closed sub variety I take the ring of polynomial functions there and that is what this ring means and these two are one and the same okay that that is something that we have proved for an affine variety the regular functions and the uh, ring of polynomials are uh, one and the same okay of course by polynomials I mean polynomials restricted to the affine variety right. So now uh, the, the so in particular you know I will look at the canonical inclusion I will look at the inclusion map a2 k minus the origin this is uh, sitting inside a2 and there is a natural inclusion map there is this map so let me put the i here okay then I will get this will go to alpha of i okay and what is this alpha of i this alpha of i is going to be a map from uh, k of let me write this like this k of x1 etcetera xn to uh, you know uh, o of uh, a2 k minus uh, the origin okay I will have this now the uh, you know that under this uh, bijective correspondence okay uh, oh sorry I should not I should not write x1 etcetera xn it should be only just x1 x2 sorry of course. So, alpha i is from k x1 x2 because it is just a uh, uh, affine space, two dimensional affine space, it is just small nominals and two variables. So, that n I wrote below before was equal to 2, right. So, I have this map. See, okay, so what I had told you is that under this bijection, you see, I told you isomorphisms correspond to isomorphisms, okay. What I will prove, what you can actually see is that alpha of i is actually an isomorphism. Therefore, it will mean that I has to be an isomorphism, but I cannot be an isomorphism because it is not even surjective because there is a point missing, okay. So, that is uh, that is how you will get the contradiction, okay. Then this contradiction will prove that uh, A2 minus a point cannot be identified with any close sub variety of any affine space, so it is not affine, okay. So, uh, uh, cl we claim that alpha of i is an isomorphism this would imply this this would imply that i is an isomorphism and that is a contradiction so this contradiction will prove that our assumption that our original supposition that uh, the puncture plane is affine is wrong okay so this proof proceeds by contradiction right so uh, how to show that alpha of i is an isomorphism okay uh, there are two things that need to be done uh, it is a k algebra homomorphism I have to show it is injective then I have to show it is surjective okay. So uh, let me explain why alpha of i is injective so first of all uh, let us understand what alpha of i is alpha of i is a uh, you know this alpha is just the map that is induced by pullback of regular functions okay. So what is the meaning of alpha of i uh, it means you give me an element here namely it is a polynomial in two variables so it is a function on this a2 okay and if you compose it with i which amounts to just restricting the polynomial to the punctured plane that is what it goes to. So it is just a polynomial going to polynomial restricted to a2 minus a point a2 minus the origin this is what the this is what the map is because pull back means you take a regular function on the target you compose it with the map in this case the morphism is i but composing a morphism with i is the same as restricting that morphism because i is just the inclusion of the subset okay so pulling back a back a map under an inclusion is just restriction the subset corresponding to the inclusion. So 
what is this alpha of i it is just take a polynomial and restrict it to the punctured plane okay. Now how do I how do I show that alpha of i is a uh, uh, injective homomorphism by showing its kernel is uh, 0 because after all it is a k algebra homomorphism to check it is uh, uh, injective I have to just show its kernel is 0. So if if I have a polynomial function okay if I have a polynomial which if I restrict to a 2 minus a point uh, vanishes okay then it vanishes everywhere because you see see if a polynomial vanishes uh, on a set it will also vanish on the closure of the set because of the continuity of the polo of a polynomial for the Zariski topology okay. Therefore if the polynomial vanishes if this is 0 then you are saying that the polynomial restricted to the punctured plane is 0 but the punctured plane is a dense open it is an open subset it is a dense open subset any non empty open subset is irreducible and dense okay therefore this polynomial is going to vanish on a dense open subset therefore it will vanish everywhere by continuity. So what it will tell you is that this polynomial as a function vanishes everywhere and uh, in this case uh, this uh, because we are working with a, an infinite field the field is an algebraically closed field so it is infinite. So if a polynomial vanishes uh, 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 as a function then it has to vanish as a polynomial. So see uh, so that tells you that uh, alpha of i is injective okay. So uh, uh, alpha of i of p is equal to p restricted to a2 minus the origin uh, is equal to 0 implies p equal to 0. So alpha of i is injective. this tells you that alpha of i is injective the only thing that I will have to now prove is that alpha of i is surjective if I prove that then I would have then I am done then it will then I would have proved that alpha of i is an isomorphism and we would get the contradiction that we want all right. So how do I prove it is surjective so we do it like this So well uh, alpha of i surjective how do I prove this well so what I do is I start with I start with the regular function on the punctured plane and I have to show that it is the it is given by the restriction of a polynomial okay. So what is the statement I start with the regular function on the punctured plane and I have to prove that this regular function is nothing but restriction of a polynomial in two variables okay so start with a regular function phi in on the punctured plane to show phi is equal to restriction of a polynomial in k x1 x2 this is what I have to prove all right this is what I have to prove. Now so you know uh, uh, so let me draw a diagram let me draw a diagram so you have something like this you have you have the, the origin this is a2 and I have thrown out the origin so I will put a circle here okay so this is the puncture plane and I have a I have a regular function on this namely uh, well I have a phi which takes values in a1 right. So this is my phi and I have to show this phi is actually coming from a polynomial right and uh, what is the meaning of saying that this is a uh, regular function let us go back into that give me any point x uh, in a2 okay then you know I can find uh, an affine neighborhood I can find a neighborhood of x ux okay uh, so you know uh, so this is, an, this is a neighborhood of x okay and this is uh, I must uh, I must admit that uh, this diagram is not accurate because the neighborhood does not look like that 
any neighborhood of a point is going to be a non empty open set so it will be dense okay. So uh, more ideally I should think of the neighborhood well as a complement of uh, some curves okay right this is how it should look like but then uh, you know uh, so you know if I take a neighborhood ux of the point x it is a complement of uh, bunch of curves all right because the only closed subset uh, the closed subsets here are curves and uh, these are the one dimensional closed subsets and the, and the zero dimensional closed subsets will be points. So it will be it, it will be the complement of some curves and some maybe finitely many points okay that is how an open set here will look like. So given a given a point x I have this this neighborhood ux and then uh, what I have is uh, the fact that it is a regular function means that on this ux it is given by a quotient of polynomials with the denominator polynomial not vanishing on ux okay. So let me write that there exists an open set open the of course the Zariski topology uh, ux containing x and polynomials. Uh, g i g x h x in k x x 1 x 2 such that phi restricted to u x is the same as g x by h x uh, restricted to u x and h x uh, does not vanish on u x. This is the definition of uh, what a regular function is. A regular function is something that is locally given by quotients of polynomials. And to make a co make sense of the function defined by a quotient of polynomials, the denominator polynomial should not vanish because you cannot divide by zero. Okay, so this is what it means. All right, but now notice that uh, the you know the uh, uh, what I need to prove is that phi comes from a polynomial all right and if phi came from a polynomial then that polynomial restricted to ux will be equal to this quotient of polynomials restricted to ux okay and you know if I cross multiply it what I will get is that I will get hx times that polynomial equal to gx everywhere okay because the fact is if two polynomial functions agree on an open set they agree everywhere if two regular functions agree on an open set they agree everywhere okay. The reason is because open sets are dense and uh, polynomial functions regular functions they are all continuous and if a continuous function uh, is 0 on a on a non empty open set it is identically 0. So if two continuous functions are equal on a non empty on a on a dense set okay then they have to be equal everywhere if they if, if two if two continuous functions equal are equal on a dense set then they have to be equal everywhere by continuity all right so so the so what this will tell you is that you know finally i have to prove phi is a polynomial okay so it will tell you that hx has to divide gx okay it will tell you that the polynomial will be equal to gx by hx on ux okay but if I cross multiply it will tell you that polynomial into hx is equal to gx on ux but then that will mean polynomial into hx equal to gx on whole affine space because if two polynomials coincide uh, on a uh, non empty open set they are the same okay. So what it will finally tell you is that hx divides gx okay. So to obtain a contradiction I will assume hx does not divide gx and I will try to obtain a contradiction. So uh, 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 assume hx does not divide gx for every x I assume that of course you know I am in the polynomial ring which is a unique factorization domain and it makes sense to talk about uh, when one divides the other because you have unique factorization any polynomial can be uniquely factored into irreducible polynomials. So, uh, so this assumption is uh, this assumption will be true uh, only if phi 
does not come from a polynomial function mind you please understand I have to prove phi comes from a polynomial function okay in other words I have to show phi is just restriction of a polynomial alright. But if phi is a restriction of a polynomial it will mean that h divides g okay conversely if h divides g alright then phi will be the restriction of a polynomial alright. So if you assume phi does not come from a polynomial which means if you assume subjectivity is false then you are actually assuming that hx is does not divide gx that is what you are assuming okay so let us assume that and come to a contradiction. Now note that on ux intersection ux prime we have well uh, gx by hx is equal to gx prime by hx prime okay you will have this all right and and th th that will tell you that you know uh, gx hx prime is equal to gx prime hx all right and now you see uh, you see hx uh, divides the right side so hx divides this but hx does not divide gx so it has to divide hx prime okay and you will similarly get hx prime divides hx so the moral of the story is that hx and hx prime will differ by a non zero constant okay so this will tell you that hx prime is equal to some lambda x x prime into hx this is what you get okay that's because you see hx let me again repeat the argument hx divides the left side so hx divides this product so it has to divide uh, but it doesn't divide gx that's our assumption so it has to divide hx prime but this argument is symmetric in x and x prime so you will also get hx prime divides hx okay and therefore uh, if two polynomials divide each other they have to just be constant multiples of one another and that constant of course should be a non zero constant okay so is lambda x x prime is not zero and well if you put that uh, back into this what you will get is that you uh, you you will get the gx uh, uh, into lambda x x prime is equal to g x you will get this okay. So it also tells you that the g's are uh, they differ by a con non zero constant multiple of one another alright. Now what I am going to do is I am going to do the following thing you know a2 uh, k is no ethereum this is no ethereum and you know any subspace of a topological space that is no ethereum is also no ethereum. So this will tell you that a2 minus the punctured plane a2 minus 0 0 a2 minus the origin is also no ethereum and you know no ethereum topological space is quasi compact okay therefore what will happen is that uh, so what you will get is that this is quasi compact uh, so you will get a2 minus is quasi compact in fact one characterization of no ethereum topological space is that every subs a, a topological space is no ethereum if and only if every subset is quasi compact okay. So this is quasi compact but you know if I take all the ux's as x varies in a2 minus a point I get an open cover for a2 minus a point and that is quasi compact so finitely many uh, of these should be enough to cover uh, a2 minus a point so this implies that the open cover ux x belonging to a2 minus a point a2 the punctured plane uh, has a finite sub cover uh, say say ux1 union uxn uxm is equal to a2 minus a point and uh, mind you each open set is being taken in a2 minus a point okay all right i am for every point in this 
I am looking at an open set there right. If you want uh, uh, the, the only problem is that this open subset might contain the origin but then you can throw it out uh, you, ca you can simply throw it out from that open set and replace it with you can puncture it at the origin if it contains the origin. So you see this therefore this union will be this alright now well uh, you see what this will tell you is that if you look at it uh, the uh, it will tell you that all the uh, see the hx does not vanish on ux okay so it will tell you that ux is contained in dhx <coughs> okay you so it will tell you that ux is contained in dhx all right and therefore what it will tell what it will tell you is that uh, all the dhx the corresponding dhxs will certainly uh, contain this all right so so this this will tell you that d h x 1 uh, union d h x n x m <coughs> will be a 2 minus this point or or it may even be a 2 itself okay. So in any case uh, every d h x contains u x. So you know if you take the union of all these d h x it has to contain this punctured plane it might even contain the origin alright. Now what I want to tell you is that each of these has a meaning uh, if you if you exhaust each case you will get the contradiction if d h x 1 union d h x n is equal to the is equal to a 2 is e if that is equal to the punctured plane what this will tell you is if you take comp complements it will tell you z of h x 1 h x n is the point okay because you know if I take complement of d h I will get z h and uh, intersection of all the z h is just z of this okay but you see for a point uh, this is actually z of the maximal ideal x1 x2 because the point 0 comma 0 corresponds to the 0 set of the maximal ideal x1 comma x2 alright. So but you see uh, 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 and mind you that you know all the h's they are all multiples of constant multiples of one another. So uh, if you look at the 0 set of all the h's it is essentially the 0 set of a single polynomial and you are saying the 0 set of a single polynomial is a point which cannot happen because the 0 set of a single polynomial has to be a curve okay because you know that uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, there are these uh, we have seen this in one of the earlier lectures that th there is a notion of geometric hypersurface and there is a notion of commutative algebraic hypersurface it is uh, it is a locus which is given by vanishing of a single polynomial and it has a dimension one less okay. So if all the h's are just multiples of one polynomial then this is just the 0 set of one polynomial and you are saying a 0 set of one polynomial in two variables is, a, is just a point that cannot happen the 0 set of a polynomial in two variables has to be. Uh, uh, union of hypersurfaces. So in this case it should be a union of curves it cannot be a single point. So that is a contradiction a contradiction okay the 0 set of a single polynomial in two variables cannot be a single point. On the other hand so the other possibility is that the union of all this is a2 okay if the union of all these things is a2 it, it, will, it will tell you that all the uh, this is something that we have already seen it means that all the h's will generate the unit ideal the ideal generated by the h's will be uh, the whole polynomial okay if if d h h x1 d h x m is a2 what it mean it will mean is that z of 
h x 1 which x m is a null set okay and this means that uh, the ideal generated by h x 1 <coughs> h x m is uh, the whole polynomial because one version of the notion says that if you take a non if you take a proper ideal a non trivial ideal then the zero set of the ideal cannot be the null set okay so the zero set of an ideal is a null set if and only if that ideal uh, contains is a unit ideal right so uh, but then you know uh, but all the h's are all multiples of one another so you are saying that this polynomial ring in two variables is generated by a single element and that is again a contradiction okay so uh, again a contradiction okay it is a contradiction because you know all the h x i s are multiples of one another so this is the ideal generated by a single polynomial and you are saying the ideal generated by a single polynomial contains one so it will mean that that polynomial multiplied by some other polynomial is equal to one which will mean that that polynomial itself is a non zero constant but then of course i have assumed all the polynomials the h's uh, so it will finally reduce to uh, uh, assuming that all the h's are constants but then that will tell you that phi's are all polynomials but i already assumed that phi doesn't come from a polynomial so i again get a contradiction okay so uh, so both these contradictions demonstrate that you know if you assume that this phi doesn't come from a polynomial uh, then you get a contradiction so it means phi comes from a polynomial every regular function on the puncture plane is the restriction of a polynomial in two variables therefore the map is surjective and we are done okay so that finishes the proof and uh, therefore the moral of the story is the punctured plane is an example of a quasi affine variety which is not affine okay so we do have quasi affine varieties which are not affine right so i'll stop here and what i'm going to do in the next lecture is I am going to tell about uh, uh, projective varieties and quasi projective varieties which are the which are the more general varieties than affine and quasi affine varieties okay. So uh, let me stop here.